from a connection. Hi everybody! Ready to do a cum review for the 20 week test. So, as you join, start writing comments down. Tell me the things that you want to study and go over and I will be happy to review with you. While I'm waiting for you to come up with topics, I thought of some things. So, the first one is, what is the difference between empirical and molecular formulas? All right, so empirical means you've already reduced it. It is already a simplified formula. And molecular is your actual molecule. So I want to use an example that you already know. You know glucose. So glucose is C6H12O6. If you reduce that down, you can divide each of these by six. So the empirical or the reduced or simplified formula would be CH2O. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of math. If they give you the empirical formula and they want you to come up with the molecular formula, um, they would give you the molecular mass. So we can go ahead, and I'm going to grab a calculator, and um, the molecular formula, uh, C6H12O6, um, C6 times 12, and then H12, times 1, and O is 6 times 16. All right. And I would have 0 .0, 0 .0, 0 0.0, because I would take each of my uh, masses to the 10th place off the periodic table. So um, this is 72. This is 12. 16 times 6 is 96. So this totals 180. All right, so let's say they had a question for me, and they said, we do not know this formula. We do not know the molecular formula. We want you to come up with it, but I'm going to tell you the molecular mass is 180. So if I know the mass is 180, and I know the molecular formula is CH2O, what I can do is I can take 180 and divide it by the gram formula mass of C. H2O. So that's 180 divided by a C is 12 plus 2 H's is 2 plus 16. So that's 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. All right? And if you take 180 and divide it by 30, you get 6. So that tells me that when it was reduced, it was reduced by 6. So I'm going to take that 6 and say C. H2O and multiply the whole thing by 6. So C6H, 6, 6 times 2 is 12O6. Hey, that's what we started with, glucose. So that's how you get the molecular formula. All right, so I took the mass, I divided by the gram formula mass of the empirical, and I come up with the entire formula. All right, so is anybody giving me questions yet? No questions yet. Ah, okay, uh, let's think of some other things that were big topics this unit because the new stuff is always 60% um, of the test, whereas old information is 40% of the test. So let's talk about gas laws. So if I have a balloon, oh, mine got popped, but oh, no, here's one. All right, if I have a balloon, oh, this is so perfect too because I can apply pressure to this balloon. So when you apply pressure, a volume is going to decrease. All right, so um, the things that I study with the gas are pressure, volume, and temperature. And if I know some values, I can actually predict changes in pressure, volume, and temperature. So my formula is P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2. That's my combined gas law formula. So. One thing to remember, anytime you have temperature, make sure it's in Kelvin. If it is not in Kelvin, you are going to get all the wrong numbers, all right? So you've got to make sure that that is in Kelvin. So let's come up with a problem. Let's make one up right here. So let's say that we have um, 58.5 liters of nitrogen gas, and it is at STP. And I want to change the pressure to 3.4 atmospheres. And I want to 
change the temperature to 500 K. All right, so those are my changes. So now I set up my formula. All right, 58.5 is my first volume. My, my standard pressure in atmospheres is 1.0, and my standard temperature is 273 equals V2 is my unknown. That's my X. That's what I'm solving for. My second pressure is 3.4 atmospheres, and my new temperature is 500. All right, what do I do next? I need to cross multiply. So what I need to do is I need that 500 to go up there, and I need the 3.4 to go down there. So I'm going to multiply 58.5 times 1 times 500, and I'm going to divide that by 273 times 3.4. That will equal my second volume. I'm actually not going to take the time to do the math on the calculator because you can all do that. Let's talk sig figs though. That has three sig figs, that has two sig figs. If this had a point, that would be three sig figs. So I want two sig figs in my answer. So when you get your answer, make sure you round it so that you have two sig figs. All right, I'm still waiting for questions to come in. Have people commented yet? No. No comments, come on people. You're not in the frame. <laughs> no, I'm in the frame. All right, so uh, next thing, Avogadro's Law. So if I have two containers and they both hold five liters, five liters, five liters, and this one is nitrogen gas and this one is carbon dioxide gas, we can talk about the um, number of moles. So let's say that these are both at STP. They've got the same temperature, the same pressure, the same volume. That means they will have the same number of moles. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd times however many moles I have in here. Now, the mass is not going to be the same because a mole of N2 and a mole of CO2 don't weigh the same. You can look up what two N's are. So N is 14.0. So one mole of that would be 28.0 grams. And then one mole of this, a C is 12 and two O's is 32. That's 44 grams and this is per mole, per mole. So the mass would be heavier for the carbon dioxide than it would the nitrogen. And another question is what about the number of atoms? So this has two atoms per molecule and carbon dioxide a carbon with two O's that has three atoms per molecule. So this one has more atoms per molecule. All right, people, I need you to give me some topics. How many are on there? Seven. Seven people, seven people, let's go. Give me your questions. <laughs> give me stuff, what do you want me to go over? Because I'll get bored real fast and then I'll hang up. Let's do multiple mole stories. Mole to mole study. Okay, Maggie Bracken, I'm right out of that. <laughs> All right, <laughs> getting the robotics shout out. All right, so let's have a formula first of all. So let's do C3H8 plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. All right, so first of all, we gotta do a little bit of balancing. To, to balance this reaction, three carbons, so I'm going to put a three in front of that, so now I have three carbons on this side. Eight hydrogens, so I'm going to put a four over here, so now I have eight of those. Three times two is six, plus four. I have ten oxygens on this side, so to get ten oxygens on this side, I would need a five there. So it's just a little practice in balancing. Now that I have a balanced reaction, I can do mole to mole stoic. And I always tell my kiddos, Stoic just means thinking like a recipe. So, if 18.4 moles of O2 were completely used, then how many moles of CO2 are made? There's my question. All right, I always set this up with a nice line. I start off with what I'm given, 18.4 moles 
of O2. Now, whatever I put there for moles or for units, I have to have the same unit here, moles of O2. Now, I want moles of CO2, so I'm going to put that on top, moles CO2. I can compare these two values because they're both in my balanced reaction. CO2 has a 3 in front of it. O2 has a 5 in front of it. Moles of O2 and moles of O2, those units cancel out. My answer will be in moles of CO2. So, I go over to my calculator. I punch in 18.4 times 3 equals divided by 5 equals. I look at my answer and I say, ooh, i got to pick sig figs. These are not sig figs because they're simply uh, single numbers from a balanced reaction. So instead, I go to the data that I was given. That has three sig figs. So I want three sig figs in my answer. So it will be 11.0. That has three sig figs in it. All right. For the sake of my honors kids, I'm going to go ahead and do a problem that does a conversion other than moles to moles. Regents, you're only going to do moles to moles. But honors, you should be able to do moles to grams, grams to grams, grams to liters, liters to particles. Any of those conversions you should do. So let's say I start off with 585 liters of O2. That was a two. And I want to know how many grams of water are made. All right, so that's a big conversion I'm going to have to do. Hi, people, can I help you? We try to get in my Oh my gosh, I have guests <laughs> running through. Welcome to <laughs> robotics. Welcome. <laughs> All right, and now who's going to solve the problem? Oh, I don't know how. Oh, I'll do none it. of my guests are solving. Oh, I'll do it. They're all gone. I'll solve, I'll solve it. it. Oh, all right, Natalie. Oh, oh no, I'm not done. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> Okay, from here. You got it? Yeah. All right. Maggie is honest. I love it. Go, girl. I believe in you. How many people already got honor? All right, but keep that. You just change that number. Just keep oh, that number. Yeah. 585. She has 7 Yeah, people. all of a sudden you change it to 582, but I know you meant Oh, she had someone. Yeah. Leaders. Matthew Barman. Hello, Matt. Here. Wait. There we go. Matt, why go aren't you here? Merm, you have a question on Yay. here, finally. Where? Right. Well, I don't she got it on is here. working on that problem. I'm going to check out my questions. Oh, Sorry. Back up the screen size. Okay. Hasn't even popped up on here. Oh, Brandon's yeah. out. Got the out message on his head. Oh, he's out. Out. He Gone. was like 15 minutes ago. Rip. Oh, you probably well, just forged your time over here. <laughs> Six people. Where's all the viewers? Share it on your snap. <laughs> Hop on the live. Come join the live. Yeah, Hop on the live. It. Usually by the next day, like hundreds have watched it because not everyone can join. Like some people are in Who's that? and hunky and whatever, but I'm we usually get a pretty nice showing. All right, let's see how Maggie is Emma. progressing with her problem. All right, <laughs> yeah, she started off with what was given, 585 liters of O2. We know there's 22.4 liters of any gas in one mole. So now she's got a mole of O2. Now she compared the formulas from her balance reaction, five moles of O2 for every four moles of H2O. And then moles of H2O down here, one mole has 18 kilograms. Yes, maybe you did it all right. So now you've got to multiply 585 times 1 times 4 times 18. Oh, I need a calculator for that. Okay, so. Sorry, I got We need to make a Oh, you didn't do this in your head, no, Maggie? Oh, so much. shame. Times 4 times 18 oh, equals. Okay, I get this huge number. And then it goes divided by 22.4 equals divided by 5 equals. Okay, so I get this big answer. And again, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't do sig figs. All right, I've got three sig figs that I'm given here. And I have three sig figs in 22.4. And I have three sig figs in 18.0. So I want three sig figs in my answer, which brings me to 376 grams of H2O. 
right? There's no problem. Okay. All right. So, thank you. Drop her into your chest. <laughs> the question that Addison asked was, can I do <clears throat> empirical formulas? So I want to make sure um, that you know that at the beginning of my video, I did go through how to do empirical to molecular formulas. But I think what Addison might be asking is how do you do one of these? So I just grabbed one of these worksheets because in order to do these problems, I have to have one. I can't make up numbers. You can't see these? They can't see that. They can't see that. Oh, this is a worksheet you might have. Maybe you have it, maybe you don't. <laughs> but you can't make up these problems in your head because the numbers won't work. So I just grabbed it and it's blank and it's got a problem for me to solve. Now, if you are in Regents and you are not in honors, don't freak out right now because this problem is not gonna be on your test. It's not a Regents problem, it's an honors problem. We so honors, stay tuned. All right, so here we go. It says that a compound has 5.31 grams of chlorine and it has 8.40 grams of oxygen. And it asks me, what is the empirical formula? All right, so I got to figure that out. So what I do is I write chlorine and oxygen. I have 5.31 of this, and I have 8.40 of this. I divide each of them by their gram formula mass. So I look up chlorine, and it's 35.5. I look up oxygen, it's 16.0. I do the math with the calculator. Okay, 5.31 divided by 35.5 equals 0.15. And then I do this one, 8.4 divided by 16 equals 0.525. Okay, those are not whole number ratios, so I can't use them yet. So I divide by the lower one. So divide this by 0.15, divide this by 0.15. This is gonna equal one, and then 0.525 divided by 0.15 is equal to 3.5. I still don't have a whole number ratio. If I don't have a whole number ratio, I'm gonna multiply both of them by two. I'm gonna double it. So now one times two, this one is a two, 3.5 times two, this one is a seven. Now I have an actual formula. So my formula is gonna be Cl2O7. All right, so that is for honors chem only. That is how you figure out an empirical formula if you are given percentages or grams um, of a substance. What do we got, more questions? No, no nothing. <laughs> people, can I say hi? Who's saying hi? No, can I say hi? Oh, yes, of course. Hi, away. this is Leah Bob and Tori Warner, Chairman's <laughs> Presenters for the Robotics. Hello. Megan Frisbee. Megan, you weren't even Megan in there. Megan Frisbee. Coming in. Hey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Robotics. Okay, but I need your questions, because review doesn't work very well unless you ask me stuff. I'm Come on, guys, pick up your game. <laughs> you just got really well, close to the camera. Talking, I don't I care. Don't Give me stuff. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna go to this packet and I'm gonna come up with more problems. Oh, heat. Heat, heat, heat. Alright, so here is the graph. I have to pee. And on this graph, I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have kinetic energy, which means I've got temperature over here and I have time over here. And let's say I start off with a solid and eventually it's gonna reach its melting point. And it's gonna change from a solid to a liquid. And then it's gonna reach we its boiling choices, point. <laughs> and it's gonna change from a liquid <laughs> to a gas. All right, so that's a heating curve. Come on, come on. So on my heating curve, I have specific areas of change. Where this slope is, and where this slope is, and where this slope is, if I wanna determine heat, Q is equal to MC delta T. All right, M, the mass of my substance, C, the specific heat of my substance, and how much is it changing temperature. I multiply those three values, and that will give me the heat of my uh, substance. All right, now, I'm gonna use another color, and right here, oh, I like that. Um, I'll use black. Here and here, on my plateaus. 
here we said it was melting, so that's the heat of fusion. So if I am here, I want Q equals MHF. And if I'm up here, I'm boiling, so I want Q equals MHV. Lastly, I want to say that in the areas of slope here, my kinetic energy is going up, but my potential energy is staying the same. SS staying the same. But in my plateaus, here, my kinetic energy stays the same. So if you are boiling water, it is going to stay at 100 degrees until it is completely boiled. Until it is all gas, it's going to stay at 100 degrees. It is not going to go up. After it has changed to a gas, then the temperature will go up again. Same thing happens here. If you are melting it, it is going to stay. If you have water and it is melting, it is going to stay at zero until it has all melted. The temperature will not change during that plateau. The potential energy is going up because you're breaking intermolecular forces of attraction. So you definitely are adding heat and the heat is being used to increase the potential energy. All right, what else? No questions. No questions. Any questions? Shout out to the Six viewers, no questions. Where's the review packet? Like, no one's questions. asking questions. Nobody yeah. is interested. People are just listening. Now, if you're it. in honors, not regents, if you're in honors, we have done vapor pressure, which is reading table H. And so table H basically looks like this. You've got pressure over here and temperature over here, chemistry. and your curves Trevor Pettit. go like that. And there are four different substances. And as you go this direction, you are increasing the IMFs. They're stronger and stronger because the boiling points are getting higher and higher. So for example, I think the third line is water. And so water's boiling point is at 100 degrees. And then whatever comes after that is even stronger than water, so it has a higher boiling point. Now you can change the vapor pressure. So over here is vapor pressure. And so let's say we wanted vapor pressure down here. This would now be my boiling point. Or for water, this would be my boiling point. All right, so reading table H. Thanks, yes, Maggie has a question. What? I always get confused between homogeneous and heterogeneous. Oh, easy, easy. <laughs> okay. No way. <laughs> Here's my two substances. If it looks like this and you can't see the particles, it's homogeneous. All right, the way we write homogeneous in a formula is like NaCl AQ. AQ tells me it's mixed well with water. So this one is homogeneous because it's mixed really well and you can't see it. If you want to separate it, you have to do evaporation because that is a dissolved solute. Over on this side, this one has chunks or layers. If they're really dense, they'll sink to the bottom. If they're really light, they'll float to the top, but they do not mix. So this is like writing FES, so that means solid iron. There it is and H2O, that would be my liquid here. They do not mix well, so that is a heterogeneous mixture. A heterogeneous mixture can be separated by filtration. All right, so those are your two kinds. Oh, what if I have a homogeneous mixture of two liquids? How do you separate it? <laughs> it's been How a while, man. How do you separate man. a mixture of two liquids? Hey, someone answer in the comments Distillation. Section. Did someone answer or did you say it? No, I just no, said no it. One answered. Oh. What's distillation? <laughs> I remember Tom! Woo! All right, so distillation okay. is separating a mixture of two liquids based on boiling point. Oh. oh boy. I'm showing myself all You look here. amazing. <laughs> Inception. So, all right, give me questions or I'm going to hang Look, it's so lagged. We Look at it. <laughs> no one's asking questions. I asked you a question. I asked a question. Because you know everything and you're ready to get in. That's holy not. Oh, wait. Are there keys for the review packet on Schoology? What was that? Are there keys for the review packet on Schoology? Okay, there is... Um, it, there is, but I will check after this. Can you guys make me a note to check it? Yeah. I have to make I sure it's published. So if it's not showing up for you, it must be unpublished, and I will make sure that I publish it after I get off. 
Alright. No questions. Well, like, right? no questions? No, there's uh -oh. just no questions. I'm looking through. Yes. There's Castle Lane. Maybe he has a question. I don't have a question yet. Bella? Oh, Maggie. Maggie's <laughs> asking all the questions. Find your castle. If you haven't done your castle, find castle. your teacher. Well, we'll find your teacher. It's due. Oh. If I, I stand up, am I still in it, or do I really have to keep doing this? No, you're still Just in it. Just the lights in, in your face. Okay. No, you're in it. You're good right now. <laughs> oh, look, I'm applying pressure. <laughs> the volume decreased. Oh, let's do those graphs. All right. If I have pressure and temperature, wait, I want to watch that. Boom. You're if gonna miss I have it. Just go to the volume and temperature. Boom. That is directly proportional. Oh, so yeah. gases, the temperature, Damn. and either pressure or volume are directly proportional. They go up like this. But instead, if temperature is not one of your um, components of your graph, and instead you have pressure and volume. It goes like this. It's inversely proportional. Um, I always tell people to think of it like this. If the pressure is high, pressure is high, <laughs> my volume is going to be really low. High pressure, low volume. All right, if instead the pressure is low, then the gas can expand out. So this is going to be very high. So that's why this graph that does not involve temperature, pressure, and volume, inversely proportional, the graph goes like that. What else? Um, yes. Take your time. <laughs> Come on, Maggie. No, I'm not question, so take your time for real. I don't um, take cams, mm -hmm. though. <laughs> <laughs>
That is the percent water in my hydrate. All right. Give it to me. Questions? Nothing. No questions. But Megan we're Birkin we're gaining said, viewers. Please start. Slowly, people are letting me down. Don't let give her me know. questions. These six people Kristen, on here need to wait. Hi? Oh, sure. Do we wait? We we have a question. Do we need to know the history? Yes, K Town. No. no. <laughs> do we right. know? Do we need to know the history of the okay. atom okay. and the different models? Of course you do. What do you mean? No, it's from Edison Glover. Edison. Of course Can you, you go over them? Because the twenty-week test means anything that you learned from day one until now. The whole first half of the year goes on the, the test. So can I go over that first? Sure, I would love to. Yay. We started off with this. I shall call it the cannonball. The cannonball model is just like all iron has iron atoms. And that's an iron atom, and it's named after the Greek atomos. And it all just looks like this. Then we realized, um, OK, J.J. Thompson, he's our first guy that really started to find things. J.J. Thompson found the electron. So the electron is the first subatomic particle. So the model is called the plum pudding model. And the plum pudding model is, hey, it's a sea of positive with a whole bunch of little <laughs> negatives around. And the way that they found that was by having a cathode ray tube. So if I have a ray tube, and this is connected to electricity, they found that on the positive side, the electrons would be attracted towards it. So that's how they figured out these first little molecules called electrons. All right, our next guy is Rutherford. So Rutherford, he did the gold foil experiment. So in the gold foil experiment, he fired um, alpha particles at gold foil. And when he fired them, most of them went right through. But every once in a while, this happens. That's a deflection. If it hits something and deflects back, this proved that there is an actual nucleus in an atom. The fact that most of them went through, that proved that an atom is mostly empty space. Empty space. All right, so he had two findings, Rutherford and his gold foil model. Great guy. All right, the next great guy. Got a lot going for him. Great guy. All right, next model is um, the planetary model, and that's all about Bohr. And remember, Bohr ring, Bohr ring. It is kind so of it now looks like this. So this is Bohr, and this is the planetary model. And he really figured out, like, hey, if an electron is here, it has a set amount of energy. And if an electron is here, it has a different set amount of electricity. This is on n equals 1. This is on n equals 2. This one has more energy because it's further away from the nucleus. And then finally, it does not look very advanced, but the current model of the atom is like, there's a nucleus. It's positive. It's small. It's dense. And here are electrons. It's called an electron cloud. And electrons are in orbitals, but they behave like waves. And they move around uh, the nucleus. So this is the area of most probable electron location. Orbitals can hold two electrons each. And so there are still orbitals or energy levels. Uh, the ener Sorry, there are both orbitals and there are energy levels. Energy levels are like this. So n equals 1, n equals 2. And so this first one can just hold one orbital, so it can just hold two electrons. And this one can hold, um, so well, as you keep going out, they can hold more and more electrons. And if you are in honors, then you've got to know about s, p, d, and f orbitals. So this has uh, one orbital. It can hold a total of two electrons. This has three orbitals, so it can hold six electrons. This has five, so it can hold 10. This has seven, so it can hold 14. And when you do an orbital filling diagram, so like let's say I have one here, and it has three spots, and this would be a p orbital, so let's call this 2p. Let's say I only have four electrons to fill in this p orbital. I would fill it one, two, three, four. So you always put one electron in each seat or each spot. 
before you put a second one in the same place. So we call that puns rule or the bus filling rule, like if I was gonna go get on the bus, I wanna expend the least energy, so I sit in the first seat that's available. And then if I'm the next person on the bus, like, oh, someone's already sitting there, so I go to the next seat. Yeah. Yes. Question, can okay. you go over ionic versus covalent bonds? Oh, sure. Ionic, covalent. Ms. McCormick would also like to let you know that you are hashtag Best yeah, you're very dedicated. Uh, Alive at school. Right back. <laughs> <laughs> I love the hashtag usage right now. Well, that's the hashtag. hashtag. So, Ionic. We have a bond between a metal and a non-metal. First thing you have to you remember. Oh, <laughs> you. I don't even know. There we go. This one? There we go. All right, if I have a metal in there. So, like, let's say I have TiCl2. Definitely ionic, because Ti is a metal, it's titanium, and chlorine is a non-metal, so when they come together, there is a transfer of electrons. So transfers electrons. The metals are left side losers, so they lose their metals, and be, or they lose their electrons and they become positive. Right side, non-metals, they're gonna gain. To name this, the two came from titanium, the one went to the chlorine. It's a middle metal, so it needs a middle name. So this would be titanium 2 chloride. That's how you name ionics. Uh, what else about ionics? They have super high uh, melting points and boiling points. They dissolve in water. They are good conductors but only when they're AQ or a liquid. They can't conduct as a solid. So if I had solid salt in my hand, it would not conduct electricity because it doesn't have mobile charged particles. The particles have to be moving to conduct electricity. So that's probably good for ionic. Oh, hard crystals. Hard crystals. All right, now I'm gonna go over here on this side to the covalent. Covalents are between two non-metals, so something like water. Water is covalent because there's no metal in there, it's two uh, non-metals. They share electrons. <laughs> Here we have Sean Bracken. Sean Bracken. Oh, yeah. Here we have Sean Bracken. Okay, covalent shares electrons. So when you have a Lewis dot diagram, oh, I'll go back and do one of that. When you have a Lewis dot diagram, you have to actually place you are, so oxygen has six valence electrons, so you place all six on it. That shows you there's a spot for hydrogen there and a spot for hydrogen there, which gives it its bent shape. If you have to know the best for shapes, this one is bent. And so this is actually a polar molecule because it is asymmetrical. There's an uneven distribution of charge. All right, they are poor conductors. They don't dissolve well. Um, they're not hard crystals, they're soft, or they're liquids, or they're gases. All right, I'm gonna go over here, just because I did not do a Lewis dot diagram of ionic. And ionic, I always see it's as easy as A, B, C, D. So A are the atoms. So if I have, I'm gonna move it over a little bit more. If I have one Ti and two Cl's, I'm gonna put the Ti in the middle. I'm gonna put the Cl's on either side. That's atoms. B are brackets. Here's my brackets. See our charges, minus one, minus one, and plus two. Those should add up to zero if there's no charge on the compound. This one has lost its electrons, so it does not have dots. This used to have seven, and now it has eight. This one used to have seven, and now it has eight. So it sort of all makes sense now. This had two, one went over here making it stable, and one went over here making it stable. So when you form a compound, you are forming a more stable molecule because now they've reached that octet rule. Who doesn't form bonds at all? There's two questions. Who doesn't form bonds at all? Not metals. No metals form bonds like oh. like titanium just forms a bond. Oh, no gases. Gases. Table. noble gases. Noble gases. Noble. Oh, so perfect. I don't need any more. <laughs> Maggie. Okay, so they're all stable. They're all perfect. They already have the octet rule. They have eight valence electrons. Who do you have more in common with, period or group? Group. group? group, because they have the same shells. 
Number of shells. Pounds. No, electrons. that's what you're Oh, that's what you're saying. Balance electrons. Yeah. They have the same number of balance pounds. if they're in the same group, so they have similar properties. If they're in the same period, that means they have the same number of energy levels, but they might not have that much in common. What they do not have in common is size. Left side, large. As you go across, it gets smaller, smaller, smaller because more and more protons allow them to hold their electrons closer, closer, closer. Whereas a metal only has one, and it's like, oh God, someone please take this. I don't want it. So if you want to give away your electron, you have low ionization energy. You also have low electronegativity. That means ability to attract. If I was 40 and I had seven, first of all, you're not about to get these away from me. My ionization energy is high. She wants to get yeah, from me. And my electronegativity is high, which means I'm really easily <laughs> able to grab electrons and take them away. Got them. Oh. All right. Give me more questions. You have two questions. There's two questions oh, here. Two questions? This one is yeah, from so Addison Glozier. Addison Glozier with the questions. Addison's really she's carrying like, this live right now. Okay. Can you no. go over the difference between molecular <laughs> covalent and network covalent? Oh. Um, so, like, oh. yeah, so molecular covalent and coordinate covalent. This one is very strong. So like my diamonds here. My diamond is only carbon. It's really strong because it, it, it stays together and the molecules are very, very close. Most molecular compounds are the things that we think of like, hey, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas. These are gases. They are not strong. They are super weak and spread out. So that's the difference. And then one more you said? Meadow says, can you go over which formulas for V, P, and T use Celsius versus Kelvin for temp? Okay, they all use K only. Anytime I'm doing, I'm gonna go back to the screen if I can find it. It was from the very beginning. Not that, not that. Okay, I don't keep them in order. Is it the first? <laughs> well, <laughs> how about that? No. Hate to see it. <laughs> Rip in the chat. <laughs> Rip in the chat. <laughs> I seriously can't find it. Oh, oh I, I think you erased okay. it to okay. something else. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. These have to be in K. No exceptions. There's no C's used at all. The only time um, that you can have a question when they're in C, but you don't even use the number in the question, is if you're doing a heat formula. So like Q equals MC delta T, it's a change in temperature. So it doesn't matter if you're using K or C, because if this is at zero, this one's at 273. If this goes up to 10, this one up to 283. The difference between them, the change is identical. So that doesn't matter if you use C or K, because it's a change in temperature. When you have other things like Q equals MHF or Q equals MHV, there's no temperature in there. It might tell you the temperature in the question, but you don't use it in your math. So it doesn't matter. Tyler wants you to go back to the heat and cooling curves. Tyler? Yes. Me, TJ? Tyler Gosling? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's TJ. What do you, want? <laughs> you, can, you can maybe, I'll call him that now, or maybe not. It might just be my name for him. What did you want me to do? Heating and cooling curves. Oh, okay. I do have that. There it is. That's a heating cooling curve. So this one's a heating. If instead I started here with the gas, and then I condensed it, and then it would be a liquid, and then I froze it, and then it would be a solid, that's a cooling curve. The biggest difference in this one, the potential energy is going down, and the temperature is going down. In this one, they're going up. So the potential is going up, the kinetic is going up. And they're always the opposite of each other. So here, when the temperature goes up, the kinetic is going up, but the potential is staying the same. And every time you're on a plateau, the kinetic is staying the same, but the potential is going up. All right, and then with this, I also just explained where the melting point is, where the boiling point is, and which formula to use if you're doing a heat calculation.
Yeah. All right, next question. I have a question. Yes, Dan Kona. When do you use the Q equals MCAT and like the Q equals MHF and the okay. HV one? Let's write out the three formulas. Q equals MC delta T. Q equals MHF and Q equals MHV. All right, keywords in the question. The temperature has to be going up or going down for, for you to use this. So like, hey, I was heating um, some water and I heated it from 30 degrees to 40 degrees. Now I want this one. This, Q equals MHF, you have to use the words fusion or melt or freeze. Those are my key terms for that one. And this one with the V in it, I want to see the word vaporize or boil or condense or if it's showing you a phase change liquid to gas or gas to liquid and here solid to liquid or liquid to solid all right those are my keywords in the question to figure out which formula to use hey you made me think of something new something else two <laughs> words that are pretty new sublimation <laughs> And deposition. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't know these words? No, yeah, we do. We do? Okay. Sublimation. Yeah. That yeah. S at the beginning well, I'm glad reminds you're in you of what it is. Class. Start with an S. The word started with an S, so you start with an S. Skip the liquid phase, go straight to a gas. Oh, you didn't go over that. That is like um, dry <laughs> ice. Dry ice is hard carbon dioxide, solid carbon dioxide, and it will immediately go to a gas. It skips the liquid phase. Deposition, here in Spencerport, we get a nice deposit of snow. Nice. So that's going from water vapor to solid snow. All right, that's the deposition one. I get it now that you said it. We went over it for like 10 minutes, but I think I like... 10 minutes? Not like 10, 10 minutes, seconds. like, More like yeah. a minute and a half, yeah. maybe. Yeah, sure. Boom. Your right. boy TJ would like to ask, when would we use Pivner? Oh. Pivner is what you use when you have two containers of a gas. So here's my two containers. And so let's say this one is argon gas, and this one is um, sodium dioxide, or sulfur dioxide, not sodium, sorry. Sulfur dioxide gas. You use Pivner when you want to find uh, the number of moles. So if these are under the same conditions, Pivner will come out exactly the same number. You'll have the same number of moles. But instead, let's say I just have this argon, and they tell me, hey, you've got 3.4 liters. You are at 500 K. And Sorry. Uh, pressure. Uh, you're at 2.4 atmospheres. All right. P, B equals N, R, T. If you are not in honors, do not freak out right now. This is not on the regions. It's on the honors test. Okay. P times V. So my P is 2.4. My volume is 3.4 liters equals N. N is my number of moles. I'm going to solve for that. R is a constant. It's on the honors um uh, reference table, 0 0.0821. T has to be in K, 500. All right. I am going to take it. I'm going to divide this side. So I need my calculator. I am multiplying 500 times 0 0.0821. And I get 41.05. I'm going to divide this side by 41.05. So I punch in 2.4 times 3.4 equals divided by 41.05 equals. All right, I check sig figs before I give you this answer. Two sig figs, two sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs. I want two sig figs in my answer. So n is equal to 0 0.20 moles. All right, so that tells me the number of moles. Now, let's take that one step further and say that we need to figure out how many grams of gas that that would be. So my molecule was AR. AR. So I'm putting 0 0.20 moles of AR, one mole 
of A R weighs, gotta go look it up. 18? No, 39.9. So off. 39.9 grams. So I multiply 0.2 times 39.9. Two sig figs, three sig figs equals. So I want two sig figs in my answer. 7.98, so that's 8.0 <coughs> grams of AR. Alrighty? We have no more questions. No more questions, no more and it's been 50 minutes. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> okay? All right. Wait, we want to be in the sign-off. We want to be in the sign-off. Okay, sign-off. Good night, people. Steady, steady, steady. Do your castle. I will upload answers <laughs> to answer keys. All right? Mwah. Love you all. Steady. I want A's. 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 And end. I really didn't need